Okay, <clears throat> one fifteen. Everybody doing well today? Yes. Good, good. I wanted to tell you that we have a tutor um, in the Learning Center in Olean who can also um, assist you if you have any questions you'd like to go over with her uh, as it pertains to uh, ANP. Um, so I wanted to announce to you uh, her name, Kyra Nolder is her name. Um, she took ANP from me, she took microbiology from me. And um, I was corresponding with Beth Lisi, who is uh, coordinator of our learning center over in the LLAC building. And she was uh, telling me that Kyra is on campus um, Wednesdays, starting next week, not this week, um, to meet with you one-on-one -on -one or through Zoom. So if you have any interest in meeting with Kyra uh, as a tutor, um, you might wanna just check out the Learning Center over in the LLAC building. Um, and Beth says that students can schedule tutoring appointments in Starfish beginning next week. So I wanted to pass that on to you before I forgot. Kyra is a great, great person. I'm working with her actually on an independent project this semester too. And uh, so, all right. Um, let me maybe begin by asking, are there questions relating to exercise uh, two in the lab book? because we talked a little bit about that on Monday, that this week we had uh, body organization and terminology scheduled for you to work on, to look at some of those diagrams in exercise two, which by the way, I wanted to also remind you, and I sent you guys an email about this, that I did post um, in Blackboard, um, exercise two. So if you go to the content section of our lecture course shell, and then go down to the folder entitled stuff to copy and bring to lab each week, because remember everything is getting put on the lecture course shell. Um, if you open that up, you will find some green font fonted folders, if you will, for both exercise two and four. We're gonna be doing four next week along with the rat dissection. So I think some of you may not have had a chance to pick up your lab manuals yet. So I, I did um, copy those off. You can print them off. That way you'll have something to work on you know, this week. And then of course, um, four is next week. Okay, so. Uh, any questions on on exercise two? It's learning uh, lots of different terms. Yeah. Um. So I was like reading over the. I just can't like I'm not sure what to do like about like the first page like I filled in all like the diagram. I did that this morning. Mm -hmm. But so you want us to put a number next to the thing and then I'm just like not sure what to do. Okay. What. When you say put a number next to the thing, are you referring to the to the handout from Blackboard? Um, it just says, uh, yeah, the lab exercise two torso model. Okay, the torso model is something we would have used had we met, and we're we're not meeting obviously this week. Mm -hmm. So, for that handout that was designed for you in mind that you would be working on this device called the torso that you'd identify organs on. So you can't do that until okay. you have access to the torso. However, I told you the other day that on that handout, in addition to the line that you would put the number corresponding to the structure on the torso model, there's another line after that, a longer line, right? 
And if you look at the directions in, on that handout, it says, please put what organ system this structure belongs to. Okay. Okay. So I think that's something that you could do for many of those structures, maybe not all of them, but for many of them. So that would be sort of a good way to begin, to begin thinking about organ systems and structures found in different organ systems. Okay. So in terms of that handout, that would be the extent to which you could use that now is just to connect structures and organ systems together. Thank you. Um, yeah. I just wish we had access to the torso model, which we won't until we start meeting next week. And then that's not going to help you out because we've got a quiz on exercise two next Wednesday. So there's not going to be anything on the torso model, obviously. I could ask you a question about does the, or what organ system, you know, does the, um, pick an example, does the stomach fall within? Or what organ system do the kidneys belong to? I mean, I would hope you'd be able to answer those sorts of questions. Can I? Yeah. Okay. I just, I, I sort of like missed, I guess I missed this. I, I've been going crazy trying to get everything figured out in time. I'm sorry that um, I guess I missed Monday. Um, I just was curious. I, I got on to the um, Blackboard um, for the for the class, and I couldn't find um, the assignment for exercise two anywhere. Well, I just posted okay, okay. that this morning. So let me go back okay. and just show you once again. Here's okay. the yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so so this stuff I just put together this morning. That wasn't here okay. yesterday. Okay. I was looking, I've been looking for a couple of days. So okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's all right. Me. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. So you know, back to exercise two, you know, as you work through this in the lab book, there are a number of diagrams, right, to yep. label. And there are also some questions as it pertains to the lab report. Right. We talked okay. about that the other day. So yep. these are really, really good to do. Okay. And you begin to learn the terminology. And boy, oh boy, there's a ton of terminology in exercise right. too. Yeah, there is. Okay. And I wish I could make it, I wish I could give you a magic pill to take and you would just learn the terms like instantly. You know? <laughs> it's just that's just not the way it works, unfortunately. Absolutely. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. So <laughs> this is where you know note cards could be very helpful. Okay. I, just as a as an option. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying you have to do note cards, but some of you like to do note cards. This yep, I think pertains to note cards pretty pretty nicely. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I told you guys also that the answers to the figures, the labeling of the figures, as well as the answers to the questions in the lab report, you have access to both physically in the room. 204. When you get there next week, you're going to see. I'm going to show you the folders. But what was the other way you could get to the answers? Don't everybody answer at once. <laughs> Come on. I told you. Take a wild guess where they might be housed. Mine? <laughs> I don't know. In the course shell. Blackboard. Right? So let's go back to that. I'm gonna click on the right folder here. Okay. So here is a folder. It says answers to lab report questions. So you choose whatever exercise you want the answers to. So we'll just pick two, right? Here's two, two and four to 10. And there are the answers to the different figures as well as the questions in the lab report. So you can check your answers at home by referring to this, or if you're at school on Wednesdays, 
you can go to the hard copy folders that are in that room. All right. Any questions on that? I had a question about um, part E in the, the book. Uh, it says the inferior posterior. So that would be like, I put um, D for it. Would that be yes. right? Yes, that is correct. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> well, Kayla, again, you know, go go to the answer key, which maybe you didn't remember you could go to and find the answer to that. I mean, you can always ask me too. Of course, I'm not trying to say you can, but uh, those answers are there. And then as far as yeah, like yeah. the quiz next week, what you can expect to see on that quiz would be, for example, similar diagrams as found in the exercise, right? Now, I'm not saying you're going to have all eight figures on the quiz, but potentially I could throw a couple of these on there and ask you to identify cavity num number two. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so study the figures, but I could equally test you by you know, asking a, a type of question like you see in the lab report. Now, I'm not saying you're gonna see the exact same question in the lab, of the lab report on the quiz. You might, you might not. But in terms of preparing for the quiz, that's kind of the way I would approach that. Yeah. Okay, so any, any questions on lab exercise two? Okay. Um, what I was sort of thinking, you know, you would do for these Wednesday Zoom classes is, you know, rather than have me lecture on whatever chapter we're scheduled to be doing that week, um, that I would simply post the lectures like I've been doing. And we could use our time now to go over material that you're having problems with or things you'd like to review. So I'm not opposed to lecturing, of course, um, but it, it seems like that would be a better use of our time if we just kind of opened it up for questions related to either lab or lecture. And I could pull up the PowerPoint and I could go over a figure or we could go over a topic that that you watched and you didn't quite make sense to you about that. Um, so that would sort of be what I would propose we maybe do for our Wednesdays. I see people shaking their heads. So um, let's try it, see how it goes. So to that end, have, have any of you had a chance to go in and look at chapter one uh, and or the first part of chapter three? Because those are the two I think I posted. That was what we were to get through this week. We were, we weren't going to get through all of three this week. We're going to spill over into next week, if I recall. Let me grab my syllabus here. Because we will be following the schedule for both lecture and lab pretty closely here. So yeah, we've got we've got one and three listed for week one, and then we've got all of next week for for chapter three. It's a fairly um, broad chapter, covers lots and lots of topics. So let's let's start with chapter one, introduction to human A and P. Um, I, I know some of you have started to look at it, and that's good, and you should be getting in there and exploring the course shell, see what's there, right? And know where to go to find the lectures. Um, 
there is a fairly large chunk of this chapter that I didn't specifically lecture on because the last few pages really refer more to exercise two in lab, the, the body positions, the terminology. I'm not um, going to include that in the lecture quiz or lecture exam. This region of the chapter, body sections, body parts and regions, we're, we're studying that for lab. And so that's why I didn't put any of this stuff on that Zoom recording for chapter one. The same applies for the, the 11 organ systems. I think I probably asked you to look over that table on page 27 where they, where they list all of those and asked you to become familiar with some of the major organs and structures found within each system, kind of getting back um, to uh, what Sadie was asking about. And also begin to associate certain functions with certain organ systems. I think a lot of us could come up with that right now, uh, you know, if we, if we wanted to do that. But that table on page 27 is definitely worth looking at. You're going to want to know the 11 organ systems. Basically, what are the organs in those systems and what are the major functions of those systems? I did not lecture on that in the PowerPoint uh, Zoom recording. So, oh, again, questions on one. Anything you want to review? Questions on that? Have you gotten into it? So I watched your Zoom and then I did your notes and then I was going to like take your advice on like doing notes with lecture and then like going through and doing notes with the book. Mm -hmm. But I didn't get to the book yet. So it was basically just like chapter one, like what is anatomy? What is physiology? Like how are they related? And like basically just homeostasis. And then the lab is like the body cavities and then like the systems. Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, the, the, the systems I would argue is really uh, something you should know for both lecture and lab. Yeah, but, but, but Sadie, you're absolutely right. I, I focused primarily on, you know, what is a &P, what are the different levels of organization within the human body? Mm -hmm. I talk about this hierarchy of organization, which is described there in that figure 1.3 on page 12, and I can pull that up, certainly. Yeah, the atom molecule. Yep. And how it goes to the organism. You got it. Yeah. Let me let me pull that up. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's let's just go to the PowerPoint by chapter. Now this is not the Zoom recording. This is just the standalone PowerPoint. Okay. Everybody see the first slide there? What is anatomy? Okay. Great. So. Yeah, this is that hierarchy that I was referring to, which is an interesting way of thinking of the body as being composed of different levels of organization, ranging from, you know, the very most simplistic in this slide called the atom. Now, could we go lower than this? Could we get more specific than atom? Of course we could. What could we get to down to? Level of what? You're muted, Freya. Single cell be like beings? Is that what you mean? Like me? No, 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 no. Here's here's cell. We gotta go below, smaller, smaller, like, smaller. Yeah, like What's the molecule or like the this, you know, electrons, protons, neutrons. Exactly, right. Atoms are made up of those three subatomic particles. Could we go below that? If yes. you will. Sure. You 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 would be astonished at how complicated an electron is. If you were a physicist, you would know that. Now we're not, this is not physics and we're not gonna go below that level, but I'm just trying to get you to think about the fact that we as organisms can be thought of as being composed of a lot of different structures, which can be thought of in turn as being organized into um, ever more complex entities, if you will, as we work our way up and follow the arrows, right? Until ultimately we have you and me. And that feeds directly into this next slide, um, 
which is homeostasis. Now, again, I don't want to necessarily lecture on this if you've already watched it, which you should have by now. Um, I mean, I can, but I'd like just to kind of open it up for questions too, to see if people have specific things they'd like to cover. But that's what you need to do. You need to get into that Zoom recording and start studying it. So, so be honest with me, how many have gone in and looked at, started to read chapter one or have looked at the Zoom recording of the lecture of chapter one? Be honest, come on, be honest. Okay, so, so I'm seeing more than half. So good, good, great. I've started to read and stuff, but I did not see the Zoom record, didn't watch that yet. Is that, that's available though? I mean, I can still do that anytime. Anytime. Okay. It's it's in Blackboard in the contents. Yep, there's a folder it says Zoom recordings. I think. Okay. okay. Yep. All right. Great. Thank you. Yep. And the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to be taping all of our Wednesday class meetings, and I'll be posting those. Should you ever want to go back and review this, maybe you you won't need to or want to, but it'll be there, and I'll make every effort to remember to record. Sometimes I just kind of forget. So any, any issues in chapter one, any problems, any things you'd like clarified? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. On the chapter one, uh, on the session uh, 1.8, do we have to study and remember from the, the term on that section? OK, I didn't quite catch what section you were referring to. 1.8. 1.8. Okay. 1.8, section 1.8 is entitled. Go to the book here. Anatomical terminology. Yes. That section we are learning about in exercise two of lab. Okay. So you do not need to know those terms for lecture. Lecture quizzes, lecture exams, we're, we're covering that material in lab. This corresponds to exercise two in lab. So the answer is no, you don't need to know section 1.8 for lecture. I'm not going to test you on that on the quiz next but whenever our first quiz is in lecture. I guess it is next week, isn't it? Okay. So instead of that, we will learn that uh, terminology on the uh, book, right? That terminology is reviewed in exercise two of the lab manual. Oh, okay. So I, I didn't have the lab manual. I just got uh, some uh, pictures that you upload in the blackboard. Right, I photocopied the, that exercise for you. So if you don't have your lab manual, you can just print that off and, and study that. Okay. You can, and you should use the, the textbook here to assist you in filling out those figures. Okay. Yeah. And not only 1.8, but uh, I would say section section 1.6. Also, a lot a lot of that is reviewed in exercise two of the lab book. The only exception to the rule within section 1.6 were, were the uh, organ systems, which I think you should know for both lab and lecture. You say section 1.6? Section 1.6, most of that is lab stuff. Okay. The only exception are the organ systems. And I think there's a slide in 
chapter one where I specifically say that. Okay. Yeah. How about other questions, comments related to chapter one? Don't be afraid to ask questions. No such thing as a dumb question. If I don't, if I don't have, um, quest I have, if I don't have question. questions, I'm assuming um, you know it. So Paige, question? <laughs> I have a, I just have a question regarding um, the class, just because um, my kids are in school and they keep getting quarantined and all that business. So I just was concerned about um, the one minimum makeup lab, how, um, how are we supposed to navigate that if we are get quarantined or, or ill or something like that? Yeah, we just need to be flexible and we'll deal with that as time goes on. That, that particular clause, if you will, in the, con in the contract, in the, in the syllabus, was a, uh, a non-COVID mm -hmm. clause, if you will. I've always had that in there. Because I'll tell you, I see students okay. sometimes <laughs> that, that miss more okay. than one class and, and, and it's not because they've been sick or they lost, you know, the third grandfather in, 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 a, in a semester, but because they're blowing off class. And I think that's not a good recipe for mm -hmm. success. But in these COVID times, obviously, you know, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to be okay. as stringent when, when it comes to that. So don't worry about that. There still would be the expectation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there still would be that expectation, though, if you missed a lab because you had to quarantine for 10 days that we talk and that you know we make every effort for you to get in and and see what you need to see but I'll work with you there sure John um, you sound like Donald Duck I don't know what's going on there <laughs> I think you were trying to ask a question weren't you John no Okay. We had some serious internet issues yesterday in microbiology and I saw on the news last night that Verizon had um, an internet issue. And a lot of the Northeast was uh, impacted by that. And I wonder if that's what happened during class. Are you guys hearing me okay or am I kind of muffled? I'm good? I can hear you okay. Yeah, okay, good. I, I just don't know what happened, but a lot of you guys live out in the middle of the boonies. You don't have good internet connection, do you? I'm out here every other week. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Okay. Um, how about chapter three? Has anybody started to look in that chapter at all? And of course, we could talk about chapter two as well, the chemistry chapter. You've got that quiz coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, I mean, I haven't looked over three or two yet. So, I mean, if you want to just talk about it so you can feel the silence, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I hate silence. Okay. okay. Um, well, with chapter two, as I said the other day, I think the best way to approach studying for that chemistry quiz is to utilize the study objectives that I've listed Okay, so again, not to beat a dead horse, but if you go into the core shell, you'll find this Word document, Study Objectives by Chapter. This is applicable to all the chapters, obviously. So as you're preparing for, excuse me, that first lecture quiz, um, You know, these six objectives may help guide you in that process. But I will just reiterate that they are very broad objectives. But I think my goal here is to get you to think about the big picture. And that's why I, I put those objectives out there. Um,
So, uh, in, in terms of the chemistry chapter, um, these are listed sort of in chronological order as presented by the textbook or in the textbook. I think you've all had, had chemistry before, right? Um, and we can certainly pull up, you know, that PowerPoint for chapter two, if you would like to do that. I just have one question in, in my, um, in my study book in like the lab book or whatever, it goes like, it's like, um, I, I have like lab exercise two, you know, the body organization terminology, and then it goes to the, you know, with, with the, um, figures and stuff. And then it goes to the, you know, the terminology and then it goes right to four. Yeah. That's that's because the lab book is a customized okay. lab book yeah. and um, chapter uh, or exercise three, I cannot tell you what that was. It, it could have been a chemistry related exercise, but since we you know, don't do that in lab, I was trying to save you guys money and by oh. not having it. Printed. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. That's, that's why, that's why, okay. yeah. Sorry. Um, So you know, if you want, I can I can pull up the chapter two PowerPoint and we can talk about that. Yeah, can you can you do that real quick? Sure. Yeah, you guys got to give me some guidance here. I I don't know where you are. I know this is our first meeting, so it's going to take a little bit of time to get used to this process. But um, all right, so we'll go to PowerPoints chapter two. Now remember, this is the only chapter that we're covering this semester that I did not do a Zoom lecture on. It's the only one. So this is sort of for you to work through yourself. I'm kind of throwing you to the wolves a little bit here in chapter two. All the other chapters have a recorded Zoom lectures using the PowerPoints. So let's go through the slides and hit, hit some of the major topics in this chapter. So the first one here is simply talking about basic atomic structure, right? I can't see the slide. Okay, sorry. Thank you for telling me. For some reason, the system doesn't always go to the same slide as I do. How about now? Yes. Okay, it's great. Nice Thank you. Yeah, don't be afraid to interrupt me. All right, so this slide is simply showing basic atomic structure. It's illustrating the fact that in the center of of an atom, we have the nucleus, right? Containing what two subatomic particles? Ignore these. I'm kidding. You know from high school chemistry that protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus, right? And the electrons are found spinning around the nucleus. I hope you knew that. You should. How fast do those electrons spin? Anybody know? Might be in jeopardy tonight. You should know this. Speed of light. That's how fast. They're, they're booking. Yeah. 186,000 miles a second, I think. It's unbelievably fast. OK. You know, I hope, that protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged. How about neutrons? No charge, so neutral. Right, they're neutral. There's no charge associated with neutrons. This uh, next slide introduces the topic of Isotopes. Isotopes are forms of an element that have different numbers of neutrons. That's the definition of an isotope. Forms of an element that have different numbers of neutrons. Which means that they have the same number of protons as electrons. What differs is the number of neutrons. And having extra numbers of neutrons in your nucleus can impart a radioactive characteristic to that particular form of the element. So when you think of the word isotope, 
one, I don't know about you, but the, one of the first things that pops into my brain when I see that word is radioactive. I think of radioactive when I think of isotope. Okay. And so there's a from science to technology box there on page 63 of your book that talks about the use of radioactive active isotopes in physiology and in medicine. It's really interesting. And what we're looking at here is a scan of a thyroid gland 24 hours after the patient received a radioactive form of iodine. Um, and what they use is a form called iodine 131. The normal common form of iodine is iodine 127. Now you might be wondering, well, where does he come up with these 127 and 131 things, right? Well, those numbers are referred to as the atomic numbers or the, or the mass numbers of the element. It's the number of neutrons and protons in the nucleus, okay? So the common form of iodine is iodine-127. And if you don't believe me, which I know you don't, you can go back into the into the uh, appendix of your book, check out page 932 if you want. Let's look at that real quick. If you have your book, flip to page 932, appendix D. That's the periodic chart, right? Page 932. And look in the Second column from the right, column 17, go down four blocks and it says I, iodine, see it? There's a number above the I and there's a number below the word iodine. Okay. So the, the number above it, 53 is indicating the number of protons, which is the same as the number of electrons in an atom of iodine. That's, that's called the atomic number of the element. The number below there, 126.9, that's, that's the atomic weight. I think I misspoke earlier. I think I called it the atomic number. It's the atomic weight, or some books more accurately call it the mass number of the element. So if we round that off to 127, right? We'll just round it off. What that says is there are 127 protons and neutrons in the nucleus of iodine. So if we wanted to know, for example, how many neutrons existed in an atom of iodine, what would we have to do? You're given both the atomic number and the atomic mass. Does anybody know how to calculate the number of neutrons? Um, subtract the atomic weight from the top number, the protons. Right. And if you take 127 minus 53, that equals 74. That tells me there are 74 neutrons in the nucleus of an, uh, an iodine atom. How many protons are there in an iodine atom? You look at the atomic number, that tells you. So it's 53. How many electrons spinning around the nucleus? 53. 53, same as the number of protons, right. So again, to calculate the number of neutrons, you take the atomic number and subtract that from the atomic weight or, or mass. And the answer is 74. Okay, let's go back to that box on page 63. That individual was injected with iodine-131. What does iodine-131 have that iodine-127 doesn't?
Remember, the atomic number doesn't change. We're talking about the atomic weight or mass changing now. The answer is it has four additional neutrons. 131 minus 127 is four. So this, iod this particular form of iodine that was injected into the patient to allow us to see the scan of the thyroid gland has four extra neutrons in it. That, that number makes that isotope radioactive. And that's why we can use special sensitive machines to see that isotope. Because your thyroid gland utilizes iodine as it makes hormones. Now, you ever heard of a goiter? Mm -hmm. You don't see people walking around Olean and Jamestown with big growths on their neck. But you can travel to many parts of the world and see that. <laughs> and that's because that individual likely has a deficiency of iodine in their diet. And the thyroid gland is, is, is growing in an effort to try to extract what little iodine it can get. Yeah, so that's an indication of a thyroid deficiency or uh, iodine deficiency. So anyway, back to our story. By using this radioactive form of iodine-127, called iodine-131, we can use these to tag structures like the thyroid gland, or we can use um, other sorts of isotopes to look at other uh, physiologic processes in the body. And that can tell us if there might be a tumor, for example. Let's say that this looks like a pretty normal scan, but what if, say, the bottom half of this, this lobe of the thyroid wasn't black and orange? What if it was just like the same color as the background? Well, that could indicate to us that that thyroid is abnormally shaped. Maybe there's a growth there or something, you know? Yeah. So there's a, just a, a slug of interesting uh, examples of how isotopes are used um, in science, not the least of which is in medicine. And if you're looking for a topic for a paper, I just thought of this. Boy, there's a lot of really cool, interesting topics you could delve into, kind of bridging the chemistry and the, and the A and P a little bit. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. Um, This is just kind of talking a little bit about how uh, water is formed. I'm not going to really talk much about that. Let's go on to the next slide. Here we're looking at um, a couple of different examples of different elements and their atomic structure. Here's the most simplistic element of the periodic chart. It's called hydrogen. It's in the upper left-hand corner of that big chart, if you look. Um, it basically tells us that it has one proton in its nucleus and one electron spinning around the nucleus. Do you see any neutrons there? Nope, doesn't have any neutrons. So what would the atomic number be of hydrogen? Anybody know? Be one, right? Yeah. How about the atomic weight or mass number? One. Would also be one. Right. Okay, here's helium. What is the atomic number of helium? Just looking at this diagram, you should be able to tell me. Two. Two, correct. What's the atomic mass? Four. Four. We count up the number of positively charged protons and neutral charged neutrons. Right. So, In this example, we're looking at um, lithium, obviously. Uh, atomic number of three, atomic mass of seven, right? Notice that in this first energy shell, it's called, these energy shells 
contain, or levels, some people call them, they contain the, the electrons, right? The first shell here can hold a maximum of two electrons. Can't get any more than two in there. So we have to go out to the second energy shell or level, which in this case has just one electron in it. If we look at sodium, like we're looking at here on the left-hand side, we're talking about one, two, three energy shells or levels, right? Because there's more electrons. I want you to note again that the first shell of any element can hold how many? Here's chlorine. Two. Maximum of two. How about the second shell of any element? Maximum number? Seven. Eight. No? Eight. 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 Eight's the magic number. No more than eight. If you go to the third shell, the same applies. You can have a maximum of eight in there. Now, not all of them will have eight, but you can't fit any more than eight in the second or third shells. And that's important to understand because that applies to how certain bonds form between elements. And here we're looking at the formation of what's called an ionic bond between a sodium atom and a chlorine atom, ionic bonds. In this particular instance, what we're seeing is the transfer of one electron from sodium to chlorine. Okay, now when you look at what what existed before this electron got transferred over. Let's put that little blue guy back into that third shell, okay? Pretend it's back here. What did we say the atomic number was of sodium? How do we figure that out? Atomic number. Number of protons, so 11. It's the number of protons, which equals the number of electrons, right? So there are 11 plus charges in the nucleus, and there are 11 minus charges in the form of 11 electrons spinning around the nucleus in a sodium atom. Okay, just ignore this transfer. Put that guy back there. You'd have one, two, plus eight, 10, and one is 11. It's 11 electrons. Everybody buy that? Okay. How about the atomic uh, mass or weight? How would I calculate that? 22, so the protons plus the neutrons. Right, it'd be 23, wouldn't it? Add, add these together. That's the atomic mass or atomic weight. Okay, so if we look at a sodium atom just sitting there all by itself, or a chlorine atom just sitting there all by itself, or any element just sitting there all by itself, what is the net charge of any element? Net charge. In other words, how many plus charges exist and how many minus charges exist relative to one another? This is not a trick question. Well, look at sodium. If there's 11 plus charges and 11 minus charges, what's the overall charge differential? If there's 11 Zero. plus charges and 11 minus charges, this is called elementary math, guys. Come on, what's the difference? Two. Huh? 22. No, 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 no. It'd be no charge. The question was, if you had 11 plus charges, which you do in the form of 11 protons, and you have 11 electrons spinning around the nucleus, which you, you have, the net difference is zero. There's no more plus charges than there are minus charges, right? Oh, okay. It's, it's, it's neutral. How about chlorine? Look at chlorine. What's the overall net charge of a chlorine atom? Zero. Zero. What's the, the, net, electro, uh, the net charge of any atom standing by itself, minding its own business? Zero. 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 Okay. 
That's important to understand because if now we transfer one electron, like we're doing here, from sodium to chlorine, what happens to the overall charge of this sodium? Becomes the positive. One becomes charge. positively charged. Yes, it becomes positive. Positive one charge, right? Does everybody see why it's positive one? Because it has given up one negative charge, right? It still has the 12 pluses in the nucleus, but what does it then have in terms of minuses? Two plus eight, 10. So the net charge is plus one. How about the chlorine? What happens to it? By negative one. It becomes negatively charged. Exactly. As it acquires this electron from sodium, it now has one extra minus charge. It has 18 of those, as opposed to the 17 plus charges. So minus one on this side. And the reason that this happens is because when elements interact with one another, they strive to fill their outermost shells. Now, if you looked at the sodium before it donated its electron, how many electrons in the outermost shell? Who knows? One. One. How many in chlorine? Seven. Seven, right. How many can we fit into the third shell? Maximum of? Eight. Eight, right. So by having this, it's called a valence electron. It's in the outermost shell. As a result of this valence electron moving, being donated really from sodium to chlorine, that fills chlorine's third shell. And that is a stable chemical situation. If you can fill your outermost shell, that's a good thing for an element. You are a happy element. Well, what about sodium? Poor old sodium gave up its electron. Well, maybe it's not poor old sodium. What happens to that element once it does that? It falls back to its second shell, which is? Eight. Eight? It's full. It's happy, stable. The result is the formation of what we call sodium chloride, or better known as what? You have it in your house. Bleach. Table salt. Salt, yeah, table salt. That's, that's what table salt is, sodium chloride. It's a crystal, right? In fact, many crystals like sodium chloride are formed as a result of ionic bonds between elements like this. So here's that plus charge we talked about earlier that falls on the sodium end of the sodium chloride. And here's that minus charge that forms on the chloride end of the sodium chloride. And this discrepancy in charge is what helps to hold that crystal together. If you could delve into the structure of a crystal from a chemical point of view, you would find this sodium ion, it's called an ion because it's got a charge associated with it. A sodium ion is attracted to the negatively charged chloride ions that surround it. Because unlike charges attract. You remember that from high school? Unlike charges attract. So that's what holds this crystal together, the ionic bonds that form between the, the elements because of the unlike charges as a result of that transfer of an electron between one sodium and one chloride. It's pretty, pretty interesting. So that's one type of bond called the ionic bond. And that this slide sort of reviews what we just talked about. Another sort of bond that forms between some elements is called the covalent bond. And in the case of the covalent bond, it isn't a matter of donating and receiving like we had with the ionic bond, but in this case, it's a matter of sharing of valence electrons, those in the outermost shell or energy level. So here we've got two hydrogens, right? 
each of which has one valence electron, right? How many did we say we could put in the first energy level? Two. Two, right. Because if we could do that, that would be a chemically stable scenario. So in this instance, those two hydrogens each say to one another, hey, I will share my valence electron with you if you reciprocate and share yours with me. And that's what we have here. We have a hydrogen molecule. Sometimes it's written in this manner, H sub two. Another way that you can write it, um, I'm not sure I can do this. I can't write on this, but you'd have a, a hydrogen and a, and a little line and another hydrogen. That little line indicates single covalent bond, meaning sharing a pair of electrons. Yeah, if we would use that, uh, the term structural formula. Um, if we had an H and a line and another H, this is the molecular formula that we're looking at here, H sub two. Here's some examples of other compounds formed as a result of covalent bonds. When water forms, we have H2O, right? You all know the chemical formula of water, H2O. It's a single oxygen and two hydrogens. And so in this particular diagram, we've got two water molecules. And notice that each hydrogen is sharing its valence electron with, with oxygen. And oxygen is reciprocating. So there's two valence electrons here in, in this hydrogen, and there's two over here. How many in oxygen second shell? Eight, the maximum number, that's stable. This is O2 gas that you're breathing in right now. It's two oxygen molecules sharing two pairs of valence electrons. So you can share one pair sometimes, or you can share two pairs, or in the case of two nitrogens, you can share three pairs. This is called a single covalent bond single covalent bond, single covalent bond. This is called a double covalent bond because we're sharing two pairs. So, so that's what covalent bonds are, equal sharing of valence electrons. Oh, here's the structural formula I was referring to a little bit earlier. That indicates a pair of electrons being shared. Here it is showing two between each oxygen to form O2 gas. Here's water. I won't talk about why these are angles. That's a chemistry lecture. But this denotes sharing a pair of electrons. There's CO2. There's what you're exhaling right now. CO2. Okay. Um, I don't want to talk about this right now. I guess a little more detailed. Let's talk about pH. pH is a measure of how acidic or basic a substance is. You remember in high school doing lab reports or lab exercises where you, you know, you dipped a piece of paper into a solution and it turned blue or red, maybe. Do you remember that? Your litmus paper? Yeah. Yeah. So you can, you can test this by just using special types of paper, or you can take and, and dip a, a, a probe down into a solution, and that's in turn connected to a, to a machine that can tell you whether it's uh, got a pH of two or 10 or whatever it might be. But the scale goes from zero all the way up to 14. pH seven is neutral as it indicates here. So if you have a solution of pH seven, it's not acidic, 
and it's not basic. It is right down the middle. It's neutral. Now, as we go from seven down toward zero, look what happens to the red region at the expense of the blue region. It's bigger, doesn't it? That's telling us that as we go from seven down to five, to four, to three, to one, and so on, down to zero, that there's more and more hydrogen ions in that solution. The more hydrogen ions you have, the more acidic the solution is. The blue represents basic, which is often measured in the form of what are called hydroxide ions, this OH with a minus charge. These are called hydroxide ions. So at a pH of seven, what do we know about the concentration of hydrogen ions versus hydroxide ions? Do we have any more hydrogen ions than we do hydroxide? They're equal. They're equal, exactly, yeah. And that's why it's not a base or an acid. But as we go down from seven, as I said a moment ago, the red gets bigger, the blue gets smaller, right? As we go from seven up to 14, the opposite occurs. We have more hydroxide ions than we do hydrogen ions in the solution, making it by definition basic or alkaline. So here's some commonly encountered materials in our world, right? Human blood, 7.4. What does that tell us? That blood is slightly what? Base. Right, basic or alkaline. Tomato juice, 4.2. Technically acidic, right? Yeah. Gastric juice, pH 2. Where is this found? On the acidic end. Yeah, it's acidic. Where do you find it? Oh, two. IL-7 of Walmart. Now, where do you find it? <laughs> stomach. Stomach. Yeah, stomach. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Well, my cardiac sphincter in my throat. Yeah, I mean, your, your stomach contents are very, very acidic. And we protect the lining, the inner lining of our stomach by producing lots of mucus. Yeah, and if for any reason there isn't adequate mucus production, then some of this gastric juice could theoretically eat away at the inner lining of the stomach and we'd end up with a what? Ulcer. Ulcer, right. Yeah. Or, if, or if this spills up into the lower esophagus as a result of a hiatal hernia perhaps or a, a lower esophageal sphincter that's not properly functioning, you can get regurgitation of this up into the esophagus and it can cause major problems. Reflux. Will it lead to cancer? It could cause that, I think, yes. Cancerous ulcers, right? Yeah. Our tissue and stuff can build up and then cause cancer, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so this is very acidic, <clears throat> obviously. This is enough to burn a hole in a rug, they say. Yeah. Um, So I think it's important to have an, a, a general appreciation of what the pH scale you know, is, 0 to 14. Um, by the way, each one of these integer changes, like from 6 to 7, represents a tenfold change in hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion concentration. So what that basically means is if you look at, say, egg white, and compare it to distilled water. The distilled water has 10 times the hydrogen ion concentration as the egg white does. Another way of saying that is that the egg white has 10 times the concentration of hydroxide ions as distilled water has. What if you go, let's say, from seven down to five. You know that five is more acidic than seven. 
But what's the hydrogen ion concentration change as you go from seven to five? It'd be 20 times. 100 times? 10 times 10, 100. Not 10 times two, 10 times 10. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. If you go from, from distilled water down to gastric juice, what's the hydrogen ion concentration change there? Ten to the fifth power, which is a hundred thousand. Is that right? I think so. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. It's a significant difference in the concentration of hydrogen ion. Now we could also say, when you compare gastric juice to distilled water, it has a hundred thousand times more hydroxide ions. The, the, the distilled water does than the gastric juice does. It's all in how you look at things. Typically, when we talk about pH, most people think of hydrogen ion concentration. But you know, you, you really have to understand that it's not solely this. When they calculate it, like you know, when you when you look at like pH four or six point three or whatever, um, it's the negative log rhythmic function of the hydrogen ion concentration mathematically. So that's why they use hydrogen ion oftentimes. And that's kind of what we just talked about. Um, and then chapter two begins to talk about the organic molecules. Organic molecules are, are molecules that have lots of carbon and hydrogen in them. And here's an example of um, a molecule called glucose. This is the straight chain form, it's called. And I just noticed that these numbers should be subscript, not superscripted. Should be six should be down below the C and the 12 should be below the H. I'm not sure why that happened. It shouldn't. Um, C6H12O6, that's the chemical formula of glucose. And what are these lines each representing here? Shared electron. Right. These are covalent bonds, single covalent. This is a what? Double covalent. Right, double covalent. So there's a lot, a lot of molecules that are held together by covalent bonds. Glucose is a good example of that. Most of the time when we talk about glucose though, we, we have to know that its most common form is referred to as a ring structure. So this kind of, Interesting uh, six-sided hexose ring, it's called, six-sided hexose. Uh, this is the form that glucose typically takes on. And I'm not gonna get into the, to the reason for that. That would be another hour's lecture of chemistry. And it's not important that you know that, but if you ever see a, a six-sided sugar like this, it's probably glucose. There are other hexose sugars besides glucose, but that's the one that you're gonna most commonly in, encounter. And sometimes what we do is we just give the bare bones skeleton of the sugar by just showing the ring. We don't bother to draw out this extra carbon at the top and the hydrogens that spin off the sides and the oxygens. We just sometimes just give the bare bone skeleton. So if you see that, you can assume glucose. And so this is a, an example of a, of a carbohydrate. Glucose is a carbohydrate. It's a simple sugar. And so your book starts off talking about carbohydrates there on page 72. And then it describes another cat category um, called lipids. And then finally gets into um, proteins and nucleic acids. Those are the four major types of organic substances. And what this slide is simply depicting is if we go back to the carbohydrate uh, family of organic compounds. Here's a simple sugar, single sugar, like glucose. Here we've got a bond between two monosaccharides to form what's called a disaccharide, two sugars. And of course, poly means what? Many. Many sugars bonded together. An example of a polysaccharide might be something like starch that you use to make pasta or bread, right? Full of starch. It's 
the polysaccharide. This is talking about lipids. Um, usually when, when I think of lipids, I think of things like fats. And one building block of a fat molecule is called a fatty acid. And what's the difference between this top fatty acid and the bottom fatty acid is, of course, depicted by those red arrows I threw in there. Double covalent bonds. Right. That makes this guy an unsaturated fatty acid. The presence of the two double bonds means there can't be a hydrogen down here or here or here or here off this carbon. So the carbons are not saturated with the, with, with the maximum number of hydrogens like they are up here. Because up here you have no double bonds and we can put two hydrogens for every carbon with the exception of the end ones. Okay, so when you introduce double bonds within the fatty acid, you take away hydrogens, making this an unsaturated fatty acid. This is important to know because if you go to look at a fat or lipid like we are here, we have three fatty acids depicted by the light yellow zones. And then here's this kind of darker yellow area. This is called glycerol, but it's bonded via a single covalent bond to the three fatty acids, right? But notice that this bottom fatty acid has a double bond in it, making this fatty acid unsaturated, right? What about these two fatty acids? They're saturated, aren't they? Mm -hmm. There are no double bonds between the carbons. So when you introduce a double bond, you actually introduce a little kink or bend in the, in the molecule, which is kind of interesting. So having just that one single double bond here makes this entire fat an unsaturated fat. So all you need is one double bond anywhere in fatty acids to make that entire fat molecule unsaturated. Typically, unsaturated fats are liquids at room temperature. So the oils that you have in your, in your cupboards at home, those are unsaturated fats. A saturated fat is typically solid at room temperature. So animal fat, like lard, that's saturated fat. Um, the stuff that makes your steak so much more flavorful, that's a saturated fat. And what do we know about diets rich in saturated fats? They're not good for you. <laughs> right. Too much can be detrimental to our health because it promotes the formation of atherosclerosis, which is plaque formation on the inner lining of blood vessels like your heart, coronary arteries. You mean like this full rack of ribs that I just bought from Buffalo? Absolutely, John. Get rid of them. Throw them out the window. <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> mail, them, mail them to me. <laughs> no, I think it's all in moderation, right? I mean, we yeah. all we all know that we probably have too much saturated fat in our diet. It's probably safe to say most Americans have too much. And that's why we suffer so much heart disease. That's not the only reason, but it's a contributing factor, coupled with the fact that we, we're so lethargic that we're too lazy to get up and make a meal. We'd rather just drive through the fast food place. And it um, is. It is. It, our food is more dangerous than what we think. Oh, yeah. Our milks, our meats, the fruits and vegetable aisles is the most safest aisle. Yes. <laughs> but it, it really boils down to the deci decisions we make, right? I mean, exactly. Exactly. If you want to jump yeah, out in front yeah. of a semi, uh, you know, that's your choice. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's a silly example, but if you think about it, yeah, I mean, we're addicted to high salt, high fat foods because they taste good. Some would argue that that's inherent in our in our DNA, actually, which is another another talk topic to talk about. But uh, it's hard to pull away from the fatty foods because they taste better. 
Not always, but a lot of times. Um, we're getting down toward 2.30. I know we didn't get through the entire chapter. I knew we wouldn't, but um, this is the sort of thing that you gotta sort of methodically work your way through um, and do. And we can continue talking more about chapter two, you know, during review, certainly, or, or even next week, I suppose. Um, you've got that, that quiz on the 10th. So that's not for another, I think it's a week from Wednesday. But, but definitely start to get into chapter two and start looking at that. Um, as I said earlier, um, we're gonna spend all of next week, according to the schedule anyway, in the uh, cell chapter. And we can talk more about that Tuesday or next Wednesday. But I really would like you to start to look at those two chapters, one and three. And if there's something that's not making sense, ask. Bring it up so we can talk about it. Um, where, where in Blackboard can we find the schedule? I've been looking, but I can't find it. <laughs> the schedule for lab and lecture? Syllabus. Yeah, so let's go into the, um, let's go into Blackboard. Let me get rid of this. Okay, stop sharing, reshare. So here's the course shell and course syllabus is where we need to go. And scroll to the very end. Here's the lab schedule here, the last two pages. And then above that is the lecture schedule. I'm on the mobile app and I think that's where my problem is. <laughs> You're on the mobile app, did you say? For Blackboard, yeah, it's, it's not, let me try and get on, on my computer. Yeah. If you're having problems, let me know, but it should be pretty easy to get to. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Just check the chat here. Um, no, Jess, you can use the same lab book, no problem. Yeah, I'm happy to, to review this. Um, it's, it's a good use of our time. Um, so again, you guys have to provide me with some guidance in terms of what you'd like me to, to, to do. I mean, I, I can't like read your mind. So you gotta give me some feedback. And this is the first time we've met and we're still gonna get to know one another. And it's, it takes a little bit of time for that to happen. But uh, but seriously, as you, as you sit down and, and start going through the lecture chapters or lab stuff, if something's not making sense, write it down. If you say to yourself, I'll just ask him, guess what? You're gonna forget, so write it down on the mar in the margins or whatever, and then ask. So the next time we see each other will be in lab next Wednesday at nine, and um, just to remind you, we've got the first lab quiz on exercise two, and then um, we should also probably talk about what the lecture quiz will consist of or what it will cover. Um, so how about if we have the lecture quiz include the section um, one, a 3.1 and 3.2 in chapter three. That's basically, uh, 3.1 is just four, three paragraphs. It's really hardly anything to it. Uh, section 3.2 is 
a review of the organelles of the cell. Okay, so the lecture quiz in lab next Wednesday will be chapter one, introduction to human anatomy and physiology and sections 3.1 and 3.2 in chapter three. It's just the very few, first few pages. In fact, the section on organelles, you have, you have heard of mitochondria and Golgi bodies and smooth and rough endoplasmic reticula. You know, you studied this in high school. So there's a nice table there on page 100 that summarizes the major organelles and what they do in the cell or for the cell. So that would be a really good table to, to look at in terms of a, of a summary. Because I'd like you to remember and review their major organelles, what they do. All right, so chapter one is intro, yep. correct? Yep. And it's from what to what? I mean, the intro is pretty long. Well, you follow the PowerPoint okay. lecture that I did, and that'll, that'll tell you. All right. Let, let the PowerPoint guide you. Is yep. it the same way with chapter three, 3.1 3 and 3.2? Yeah. Yep. I did not spend time lecturing on the organelles. I think I told you in that Zoom lecture that I was going to hold you responsible for reading over that, there's like, I don't know, six, eight pages of organelle stuff. You've heard of this before. You should be able to. That, is this, that an, are, you, are you in the lab book or the book? I'm in the textbook. I'm in the text. Yeah, I'm talking about the lecture quiz. Yeah. Because remember, we're taking both lecture quiz and lab quiz in lab. And then finally, in addition to the two quizzes, we're going to do the microscope exercise and the rat dissection. So bring that handout with you for the rat dissection. Here's a couple diagrams nice to have handy to look at. Okay. Any last minute questions, comments? Are you getting a sense that this is going to be a pretty intense course? Jesus. Get your seatbelt on, buckle up. Um, it, it, you know, this is kind of how it's going to go. Um, be organized, be focused. That's key. Don't fall behind, ask questions. And um, you know, don't do, don't be too hard on yourself, but you know, you, you really have to put a lot of time into this course. It is one of the more challenging courses, but I will simply tell you um, that I have taught lots and lots and lots, thousands of nursing students over the years. And you can ask any of the nursing instructors downstairs how my students do when they get to nursing. And every one of them will tell you that if, if you can get through Ratterman's A&P, you will do super great in nursing. And I'm not saying that to be prideful because I'm not that kind of person. I'm, I'm just telling you that there's, there's a reward for you at the end of this. And don't, don't, don't lose sight of the fact that it's going to be challenging sometimes for you, and it will. <laughs> but don't lose sight of the goal, all right? You can get there but you're gonna to have to bust your butt sometimes to get to where you wanna go. But like anything, it's, it's worth it. It will be worth it for you. And I'll, I, you know, I'll probably seem like I'm being a pain or a, a difficult instructor, but you know, I want you to do well in nursing. I, I cannot have you get there and not succeed. And you, you will succeed in nursing, you will. I, it's happened, I've seen it a thousand times, but you, you really have to uh, adopt a real good mindset and you got to be focused and you got to work hard, but you're going to have the tools to succeed when you get to nursing. My field is medical coding and I can't do it without this. I can't, you, I, there's no way I could show up for work. Right, right. 
same for, same same thing for you, John. Really, yeah. So there's no way I could show up for work without knowing it. I can't even do my coding books. Mm -hmm. So we're we're laying a foundation. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Well, I won't uh, keep you any longer. Have a great rest of the week. We'll see you Wednesday. Thank you. You bet. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Sure. Good day. How do Thank I you. get a hold of you um, after this? Um, well, we can chat here now if you'd like, or as I said, if you want to, um, you know, do a Zoom office hour, you could go into Starfish and reserve a day and time. Um, I was kind of hoping, like this, this chapter one right here, I don't really get it. Well, have you looked at the Zoom lecture yet? Oh, that's, that's, yeah, I saw that. I haven't really went in there. So just go to the Zoom lecture, introduction one, and it'll, because I saw that. Okay, all right. And then, so if I just follow that, yeah. and follow the PowerPoint, I should yeah. be good. Yeah, yeah. Great. And then chapter three, we I'm only looking at 3.1 and 3.2. Correct. Yeah. For, for, right. the, then, for the quiz, the lecture quiz next Wednesday. Yeah. That doesn't that doesn't mean you can't go beyond that. Oh, I will. You know, but in terms of what you're going to be tested on, if you will, that's how far you need to get by next Wednesday. Thank you. Yeah, sure. You have a good day. I'm gonna have me some ribs now. Hey, enjoy. <laughs> Bye. Bye.